fun fact about Jennifer O'Donnell of the North Vancouver District Public Library, who's going to be talking to us about privacy impact assessments, is that um, in 2016, the North Van District Public Library registered over uh, 4,170 kids in the SRC, um, which was 36% of all their local elementary school kids. And uh, in the 52 years that the library served their community, one of the most interesting facts is that they've had a sniper attack. They still have a book with a bullet in it to prove it. <laughs> That's a really fun fact. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Nobody was hurt. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the article that I can send you if you want. <laughs> I'm just setting this up so I don't go completely over time on you guys. Okay, privacy impact assessment. Who here doesn't love privacy? <laughs> Um, so what I'm going to talk to you today about, I've spent a lot of the last part of the six month, last six months in the privacy impact assessment world, and I'm wanting to share a bit about what's going on. We only have 15 minutes, and I'm wanting to leave some time for questions, so I'm not going to go into too many details about what exactly we're needing to do, but you can always contact me. What I'm rather going to show it, or talk about is the my experience with it, our experience at Northland District Public Library, the reflections that we've had, some, I'll be talking about some details. Um, and my main takeaway today I'm going to share right up front is I'm wanting to advocate for collaboration. I think within the privacy world, we, with libraries, collaboration is key. It's a really big complex piece and so I'm wanting I'll be talking about collaboration, and I'm also going to be talking about the co-ops, CAFA server, and the having libraries advocate to be able to use that on a cost recovery basis. So there you go, Tommy and Lori, and whoever else is here from the co-op. Um, being really clear with my biases, because I think it's in everybody's best interest for us to be able to do that. Um, so we embarked on looking into the privacy impact assessment sort of last November. It was, it's been on our radar for a while. It's been, it's, uh, Jennifer at Surrey had mentioned it um, over the last couple of years and sort of just, we kind of knew a bit, but not really that much. So we decided to delve into it. Um, it's, we thought, we didn't think it would be really quick, but we thought like a couple hours work, a week will be done. Um, no. It's, <laughs> much more complex, much more confusing, getting information. Um, I did get a lot of information from, from Jennifer and Jim at Surrey, from the OIPC, the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner, um, and tr just trying to get information. So we embarked on this, we just basically had just the briefest of information. We had the template that we were, what, that we thought we were supposed to be filling out, and we had, Sur Surrey had shared their self-assessment PIA. So at Surrey, the, the, the official template that you have to fill out is about 13 pages, and Surrey has sort of a brief one page or one and a half page document that they do as they're looking at new resources to sort of answer the key questions about privacy and how people are, or how the, this product is going to meet the, the FOIPA or the Freedom of Information Protection Privacy, I think I'm going to get that wrong, um, Act, and for, it's sort of like the Privacy Protection Act. So I had that information and was embarking on a learning investigation. So what is PIA? I've mentioned this a couple of times. So a privacy impact assessment is a tool that's used to evaluate the impact on privacy. Um, so you're looking at your compliance with, within FOIPA, so the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, um, and how, how you're dealing with personal information and how are, are you in compliance or not. Um, one of the benefits of libraries completing it is that it helps promote transparency and accountability. It lets people know that you're actually dealing with their personal information in a responsible and appropriate manner. Um, so what are the requirements? It's 13 pages, very detailed. I'm just gonna give the briefest of overviews. Um, 
So the first part of it is you're doing sort of a general description. So you're talking about the product that you're you're doing. The the PIA that we've been working on was for Lynda.com. So that's my we and we're in the process. So we I, I'm speaking from the perspective of we have done almost one. <laughs> um, so I take the generalizations for what they're worth given the context. But I also think we're one of the first libraries that's actually embarking on doing this full process. Um, I think Surrey has also been working on it, but we're, it's, it's not a common thing, so we're trying to get that. So you've got a description of the initiative and what you're wanting to do, what the scope of the PIA is going to be. Um, and really importantly, you're talking about the elements of the information or data that are involved. And this is where it can get tricky because depending on how you're authenticating and what, so how you're authenticating and what your ILS is will really impact how much data you are sharing. So we at North Van District, like a number of other libraries, are using Horizon and we're using SIP2 to authenticate, which is a really standard authentication protocol, which sounds great, except SIP2 with Horizon sends what's called message 64, which basically sends the entire patron record unencrypted. Um, so not just their bar, the patron's barcode and, and PIN and like location code that might be need to, needed to use to authenticate it, but their full name, their address, their phone number, their email address, how many titles they've got out, how, what, their, what their holds, um, how many holds they've got, if they've got fines, have they had overdues, have they had, so it basically sends the entire patron record, not what they've borrowed, but enough that it's problematic in terms of trying to be meeting privacy concerns. Um, Another piece that you're looking at is, the, is a, there's a section on the protection of personal information. So you're looking at the storage and access of information outside of Canada. So you need to be really clear of what information is being set out, sent outside of Canada and how are you dealing with that and are you meeting, are you, um, meeting the requirements of FOIPA in, in doing that. Um, one, of our, one of the ways that we were looking at it, because we are a mid-sized library where we don't have, we've got the resources of a mid-sized library. Um, so there's full, full FOIPA um, compliance, which is like the gold standard. And then there's, we're doing nothing. And there's a whole spectrum along there of what can be done. So uh, one, of, one of the pieces that I was doing when, when I was looking at, at different parts of this was, okay, if we wanted to fully comply we would do this, and actually to fully comply to do this for Linda, we actually would have to fully comply to do this for this and this, and it's just, it's just this rambling piecemeal web that goes forever, um, which is not realistic for the resources that we have to be able to spend on it. But there might be other things that we can do. So it was looking at all of the different possibilities and, and presenting the pros and cons of each of them. So as we're looking at how we're wanting to proceed, our management team can figure out what is reasonable, what is a reasonable act for our, a library of our size, given our resources, given what we're able to do, um, to be compliant. So for example, we don't internally have the resources at this time to come up with a nice secure authentication that's not using SIP2. So we can't, we, like it's, it would, to create that, it's, it would cost a lot of resource ability. The co-op, already has it, so another plug for us possibly being able to use uh, libraries to be able to use the, the co-op's capital server on a cost recovery basis uh, because it's already built and it's fully compliant. But because we couldn't build it, but one of the things that we could do was to put up a notice on our website. So for all of our SIP2, all of our products that use SIP2, we put a notice on our website that said, um, that with a fully compliant note. So a fully compliant note has to include the purpose for which the, the material or the personal information is being collected. What are we collecting? Why are we collecting it? What are we going to use it for? What is the legal authority that we have to collect it? And what is the contact information of our privacy officer for people who have questions? Um, and you have to have a clear I consent or I don't consent. So that was something we could do, right? When we looked at this whole range of things, um, we still do need to figure out the um, authentication piece and sending unencrypted data. That's not a happy thing to be talking about. But we can do the website. So we can say that as of March 2nd, everybody who signs up and is using, uh, using lynda.com and all of our other products 
have opted in to this consent. So it's sort of looking at all of these back and forth pieces. Um, you're looking, you, you look at the data flow, so you figure out exactly how is data flowing. So from the time that the user enters it to the time that they've finished, the trend, the, finished using it, where is that data going? So you create a data flow and then you, again, for each of the data flows you write, or each of the places where it's going, you say what you're using it for, what, what, what's it, what is its use at that, at that point, and what authority do you have for that to happen. Um, you're looking at risks and how can you mitigate risks and um, how are you securing information both physically and, and technically, how are you ensuring the accuracy of information. And all of this takes time. Um, understanding what's being asked, I'm sort of looking at it for the first time. Not, I, have, I had some resources. I had um, Surrey and Jim at, at sorry, Jennifer and Jim at Surrey were incredibly supportive. They shared everything that they were able to share, but they weren't able to share their full PIA. And at the time, I was thinking, like, let's just share, let's collaborate, let's share as much as we can. And now that I am living in the depths of PA world, I understand that there are reasons why we might want to sh we might not want to share everything. Um, when we're talking about our risks and our risk mitigation strategy, there might be a practical reason why our senior management team or our board says we don't actually want to say all of our risks and how we're mitigating it because people then can either circumvent our mitigation or go, oh, look, cool, you're mitigating it by doing nothing. Oh, okay, well. Um, so there might be reasons why we don't want to do this. But in terms of speaking from a collaboration perspective, there's a lot that we can share. So if, I, if we're not wanting, if, I, if, I was, if we finish our PIA and we're able to share as much as we can, there might be places where we would have to black out information and say, we're not comfortable sharing, sorry, we're not comfortable sharing this information, but contact us. We're happy to talk to you and tell you what to look for or what kind of things do you need, what questions should you be asking, um, things that we might be willing to verbally say without physically having it all written out with signatures. Um, what else took us long? Um, understanding some of the technical requirements, it was really challenging to understand what exactly is going on with SIP. Like, there's not a contact at SIP that you can ask. You really just have to understand. When you call the vendors, if the vendors respond, they, the, our vendor, the Linda com is like, oh no, we're just collecting the barcode information. We only care about the barcode. I'm like, no, like there's, there's, if, if that was true, people wouldn't have a problem with SIP. What is going on? No, we're just collecting the barcode. So it was like pulling teeth to get information from them. We just kept sending lots of emails. And, and finally, the, what got us a response was, we're considering pulling the service if we can't get answers about what's going on with the security. And once we did that, after months of them not responding at all, we, within hours, we were on, on track to get information. But again, the information that we finally have collected from Linda is usable for everybody else. It's not as though the physical and technical security that Linda is using for North Van District is going to be different than for Fraser Valley or for Surrey or for North Van City, right? Like it's the physical security. So again, speaking to collaboration, if we could have a space, say, on the co-op site, I think Tammy and I were talking about possibly having a space on the co-op site where we can share the information, create, come up with some way to share the information, um, have information of what to look for, have, this is where things might be different. The ILS that you use may impact what, um, what risks you've got and liabilities, but other than that, like, we should we share, share, seriously. <laughs> I'm kind of running away from my notes and I'm running over, I'm not quite running over time, but I'm wanting to have time for questions. Um, the OIPC, so it's the Office of the Information Privacy Commissioner, they were incredibly helpful. Um, the man that I spoke to there, it took a while to get in touch, but once we were connected, he provided so much information. He was willing to talk for, I probably talked to him in total for a couple of hours over the course of the months. And he would answer really detailed questions, which was very helpful. A caveat, though, is that the OIPC is, Brad is a lawyer, the, the people that I'm talking to are lawyers, and they're coming at it from a very legalistic and prescriptive and compliant perspective that may not work for each library, again, based on what the library's resources are to, to meet, the, meet the requirements. Um, and then another th reason that it took a long time was because it we were, one, we were one of the first libraries doing it, and it was our first one. 
I think when we do a subsequent one, when we're looking at doing our, we, we now have a template. We know the questions to ask. We know how our ILS works. So we, it, it will, I think we'll be a bit more streamlined. And when I think of other libraries doing it, especially if we're able to um, have a, have a, have a um, shared place where our notes are, and if we're able to use the Kappa server with cost recovery, um, then it will help mitigate so much and it will help us streamline. Libraries are doing all sorts of different things. VPL and Surrey are larger libraries and they've got um, in-house custom built systems to deal with the authentication for their website and it, it is meeting FOIPA requirements. Um, of the two, Surrey has actually gone through the whole process of doing the PIAs and their IT department at the municipality is doing their PIAs. Um, VPL has not done any of the privacy impact assessments and they are compliant. So they, they, their, their focus has been on making sure that we're compliant. They haven't actually done the PIA. It's not a requirement that you do. It's not, it's not required that anybody do a PIA. So I, I've sort of been speaking as though it's a requirement. It's not a requirement to do a PIA. What the PIA does is helps you, it's a tool to help you assess where your needs are. So Vancouver has not used that, but they're very much aware of the law and, and the, the regulations. For smaller libraries especially, it's very useful to be able to look and say, where are we and are we not compliant? Where are we at risk? Um, so there's no, there's no like set, hey, do this, other than let's collaborate, library licensing business function group, let's try to figure out how we can share the information, and let's all encourage the co-op to help us do that. So that's me. I think I'm out of time, but are there, do we have time for questions? Or we've got a minute. Are there questions that we could ask in a minute? <laughs> Okay, I see no questions. I am available, so I'm Jennifer O'Donnell, Northman District. In, in the spirit of collaboration, you're welcome to contact me if you are embarking on this. Once we have gone through and have, have completed our PIA for lynda.com and, and our subsequent ones, we will be doing what we can to share what is possible and move forward.